As I mentioned, we were waiting for police uh, in this uh, case where they are looking for a sheriff's deputy. Let's go ahead, listen in live here on Live Now from Fox. Folded. Uh, we just had some breaking developments here uh, prior to coming out to the press conference. We're going to explain those as well. Um, but a lot has gone on uh, since uh, about 1245 this morning, one o'clock in the morning uh, to now. So a lot of a lot's going on. I'm bringing the chief up to start with the uh, event as it unfolded when we received the first 911 call. Thank you, Lieutenant Kelly. Uh, about 1245 last night, we received a 911 call from the 3100 block of uh, Cran Col Colbert Place, or Colbert Lane. And uh, <clears throat> the caller called and said that there was uh, an intruder that had come into the house uh, that uh, had it was brandishing a firearm and uh, ultimately uh, fired that firearm uh, and killing two people in our community. Uh, it's a great loss for, for our community, and uh, it's even more disheartening to find out that it was one of our own that uh, actually was the trigger person uh, behind this tragic incident. Uh, the officers responded to the scene, as well as medical personnel. Unfortunately, the, the wounds that uh, the victims incurred were life-threatening uh, and could not be treated there on scene. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, numerous personnel that is processing that crime scene right now. We have assistance from the Alameda County Sheriff's Office Crime Lab and their Coroner's Bureau, and uh, we'll be processing that scene uh, for the evidence that, uh, that is there. Um, from there, uh, through that 911 call, uh, we received some information that the suspect had fled the scene uh, in, a, in a dark colored uh, vehicle. We were able to garner um, investigative leads on that particular vehicle. Uh, and we put out a, a bulletin to all of the surrounding agencies uh, throughout the state of California. Um, just recently, um, we received a call from the suspect and uh, he wanted to turn himself in. And so we were able to have a conversation with him. And uh, during that conversation, um, we were able to keep him on the phone line and uh, direct uh, the CHP units uh, down to the area near Kalinga uh, to take the suspect safely into custody. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Lieutenant Kelly. I, I, I want to, you can hear the emotion in Chief Holmes's voice, and I, I want to tell you why. It's because uh, Chief Holmes personally talked uh, the suspect into surrender and spent about 45 minutes on the phone with him um, to uh, get him to surrender peacefully. And I I, I've known Chief Holmes for a long time. I can see the emotion and feel the emotion in his voice. So um, this has been a very difficult day for, for him and for our department. So I, I really want to credit uh, Chief Holmes for his leadership. And he just so happened that, that when the call came in, we couldn't let it sit. So he picked up the call. Uh, I was with him uh, and one of our crisis intervention deputies. And, and he was able to bring this to a peaceful resolution. So thank you, Chief. Uh, I, I can see and feel uh, the emotion of, of what he just did, uh, a very, uh, very uh, noble act on your part, sir. So thank you. Um, you're going to have a lot of questions for us. Uh, and so I, I, we're ready to answer those questions. Uh, there's some questions we don't know the answers to, so I, I'm willing to go there. But uh, so where we stand now is this is a, a, an active double homicide investigation. Uh, there was a third person present in the home at the time uh, of the double homicide. That person uh, is safe. That person is a key eyewitness. Our investigators are working that. We have uh, the scene here on Colebrook in Dublin being uh, investigated, our crime lab personnel, uh, and all of our detective staff. Um, we have st staff uh, deployed now to the Central Valley where we have safely taken Mr. Williams into custody. At this point, uh, we will meet with the Highway Patrol. I want to credit the Highway Patrol for their quick action. They deployed resources. Uh, in a part of the state that's very rural uh, and desolate during this very trying time with the temperatures. Um, I, I, I really can't tell you in, in my time here how impressed I was with uh, Chief Holmes's ability and our team's ability to, to really get this to a safe surrender. I, I'm really, I'm really uh, humbled by that thing. Uh, as you can tell, our agency's in shock. This is not something we deal with. This is not what we're about. We uh, 
had no idea that this could happen. Um, Mr. Williams, as you all will delve into his life and his background, you'll find that he grew up in a very fluent home, well-loved, graduated from college with honors, uh, was really uh, a remarkable young person. Uh, how we got here today, it will be part of our investigation and something we'll be looking at as a law enforcement profession. So um, I'm willing to take some questions now. Uh, you'll have to forgive us. Uh, we just had some very emotional moments as we negotiated this surrender. So I'll start over here. He is in custody. Um, has he been booked yet? And no, we, we just took him into custody five to 10 minutes ago, uh, down near Colinga, exit 337. Uh, the California Highway Patrol got there. Uh, we also had aircraft up in the air uh, to, to, to get to that location. Our detectives are en route to, to the Central Valley uh, to meet with our CHP partners. We will take custody of Mr. Williams. We'll bring him back here to the Dublin Police Station. Uh, once he's here, uh, we'll speak with him and uh, further get details. I can tell you that he did uh, throw the firearm out. There's an active search underway right now. Uh, near the Altamont to recover the firearm. We, we hopefully have a, a, an idea of an area where the firearm was discarded. That helped us in our conversations with him. He explained to us that he did not have any other weapons in the car. We were concerned about uh, his potential to inflict more violence or uh, to harm himself. Um, so the chief was able to get that information. Um, and, and it sounded like uh, there were, at that point, we knew there were no other firearms in the car. We believed, it sounded like he was being truthful and honest with us. So that really helped de-escalate uh, the stress level as far as a, a confrontation. He complied with everything uh, and surrendered peacefully. And so we're, we're on, in the midst of uh, doing that exchange with CHP, uh, obviously time and distance being a factor. So he'll be back here later this afternoon. Can, uh, can you just explain the relationship between him and the victims? Was there some... So that's, uh, that's a key question. We're looking in, into the relationship. There is connectivity between Mr. Williams and the victims. Uh, the victims are a couple, a married couple. Uh, they do have a child uh, uh, in common that's uh, here in, in Dublin. Uh, this is a, uh, one of our more uh, upper middle class affluent communities. It's, a, it's an area where there is not violence. These things don't happen. Uh, and so it's a very shocking for that part of the community, that neighborhood, uh, to have to deal with this. Uh, we're trying to make sense of all this and lead our community and lead, lead our agency uh, and this city through, the, through this very difficult time. So, a lot of questions to, 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 to come. We, we believe we'll get the full picture. We believe we'll, at some point we'll land on a motive as a reason as to why this happened. Uh, we'll slowly get there and, and we'll make that available when it's time. But he knew them, right? It's not like he knew crime. them. He knew them. This was not a random crime. This is not, uh, this is a, uh, a, a very bizarre chain of events that unfolded. And uh, I think as the, as the story unfolds, you guys will understand that better. Uh, they, they have a, uh, a, a juvenile, uh, adolescent child, uh, younger child. Uh, don't want to get into specifics on the child. Uh, but, I, but I will say there was a, a relative of the family that was in town that was visiting. Uh, and when this event unfolded, that relative was present in the home and became a key eyewitness uh, in this investigation. The weapon that you're seeking to recover, is that kind of the deputy security weapon? We believe it is. Uh, it, it, it was his uh, duty firearm that we're actively looking for now. We believe it was discarded somewhere on the Altamont. Uh, our people are out there now uh, searching for it. Uh, hopefully we find it quickly. Uh, and uh, it's thankfully in a rural area, so we don't have any immediate major concerns that someone could come across it. We think he discarded it in an area that's likely off the uh, anywhere from the public. Did the suspect give any commissions or describe anything about the act? You know, we, 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 when you're engaging in these conversations, they're very difficult. He, there is, uh, obviously, it was, we were able to record some of the conversation. There, there's been, there was discussions, but I think the chief did an outstanding job in, in keeping it relevant to the moment. And in dealing with someone in crisis, in mental health crisis, uh, you have to carefully uh, work your way through that. And you, it's a very, uh, 
uh, you have to watch the tempo of the conversation. I think uh, the chief, with all his years of experience, did a fantastic job. There, there's a lot in those conversations that will be relevant later, but as for now, uh, I think that uh, we did an outstanding job intervening, de-escalating, uh, using crisis intervention techniques with our staff uh, to, to bring this to a peaceful resolution. You mentioned mental health crisis. Does he have a history of mental health concerns? No, there's nothing in his background that would indicate that. Uh, that will be, he's been with our agency for a year. We're going to go back in time. We're going to look at what's transpired in his life over the last year to see exactly what led up to this moment. So that'll all be part of the investigation. Um, we want to look at that not just for the purposes of the criminal investigation, but for, as a, from a law enforcement standpoint to see. Um, we do very, very thorough background investigations, and I think our people are, are saying, um, did we miss something? Did we, did we not do something right? Everything that I've seen, everything that's been reported to us would indicate that he was a very good candidate for law enforcement, that somewhere in the last several months of his life, some significant events happened that led up to this moment. A lot of those events went undiscovered and undisclosed, and we're going to be looking into that. I think there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. And did this couple play a part in some of those events that have unfolded over I, I think so. I think that, that as that story unfolds, we'll, we'll know more. But I think that, that obviously, yeah, to lead to this seriousness of a, of a crime, uh, there, there's a lot going on here. So pretty early on, but at this point, um, being that this is one of your own, are you guys planning on handling the investigation um, from start to finish on your own? So here's what we'll do, is, is here's what we're going to do. This, this is a homicide investigation. The fact that it's a, a, a law enforcement deputy sheriff employed by our agency uh, is a factor, and, and I think it's important toward public transparency. What we will do is we will bring in the district attorney's office from Alameda County. Um, if we, at any point along the way, see any conflict of interest, or any issue, which I don't think there will be, we will, we will immediately uh, bring in other agen agencies uh, to help. But our district attorney's office is well equipped to come in and partner with us on this. Uh, we will be and are in contact with them. Uh, so this will be uh, open, transparent. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, this is a tragedy. Uh, we're, we're, we're all in, we're in shock here. We're in shock. With one year of service, does that mean he was in the jails working there or was he on the call? So because of, uh, he was currently assigned to our courthouse division uh, and he worked in Oakland at our courthouse in Oakland. That's uh, based on uh, his assignment when he came to our agency. We've been trying to staff our agency. Law enforcement's been having a difficult time staffing our agency. So he was, uh, normally he would go to our detention and corrections division, but he uh, went to our court division and he had worked there um, and uh, done, a, done a very well job. I mean, we have not heard anything you know, about him being any problems. He was not on the radar of any of his supervisors. None of our, his fellow employees or personnel reported any type of uh, incidents to us. So uh, we're, we're in shock, as you can see. Did he give any, in, excuse me, any indication why he was willing to turn himself in at that point? Did he seem remorseful? I absolutely felt a lot of emotion and, and uh, uh, I, I, I think we, we heard from a person that was very disturbed and that was very in an emotional crisis. And when you've talked to somebody and, and had to deal with that, you, you're trying to get them minute to minute to keep them alive. I, I, I think that uh, it, it, was, uh, it was phenomenal work to, to, to get him to surrender. I, I really do. Can you confirm that the suspect was a collateral hire that he worked in Stockton? Before? Yes. So, so he was, he was a police academy graduate, um, and in California, you, once you graduate from the academy, you you typically go through a California certified uh, field training officer program. That program, in most agencies, lasts up to about six months. As you go through that program, you're on a probationary status. As you go through the program, you have to meet certain criteria to successfully complete the requirements to be a solo police officer in the state of California. And his uh, time at Stockton, he did not pass his probation. A lot of those issues that we found were related to uh, 
his skill set and his ability to effectively do the job. They were not based on uh, any type of conduct or uh, it was more of his ability and his skill set wasn't meeting the criteria that, that this job demands. And so at that point they let him go. That's not uncommon. He then applied for our agency. We did a very thorough and complete background done by one of our top investigators, a psychological exam, uh, a voice stress uh, analysis exam on him, a complete and thorough background, talked to everybody in his life and did not see there was nothing in his background. He's 24 years old, so he doesn't have a lot of uh, life uh, experience per se, and so his background was immaculate. Can you give us any information about the victims? How old were they, and did they have any connection to law enforcement at all? No, they have no connection to law enforcement that I'm aware of. Uh, I believe our female victim is 42 years old, um, and the husband, the male half, we're not ready to release the names yet, uh, I believe is about 58 years old. Do you have a timeline for the events at this point yet established, you know, seeing, seeing that he said he was in Stockton and the chain of events of the timeline for him to come up? We know that he worked yesterday at uh, starting in the morning at 8 o'clock in the morning at the courthouse. We know then at about 5 o'clock uh, he took an overtime shift at the Santa Rita Jail. After his overtime shift ended at 11 o'clock, he got off, left the facility, um, and then the timeline between 11 o'clock at night and 12.45 in the morning is, is what we're trying to fill in. Was it only the three people that were home, the victim and the relative? I believe the, uh, there was a child as well <clears throat> present in the home but did not uh, witness the events but probably heard them. Two oh, and two other family members. So there was a total of five people. Six. Six, excuse me, six people in the home, uh, two which uh, were killed. Did uh, Mr. Williams have any connection with Dublin Police Services? No, he does not work here. He has never worked here. He's never been assigned here. He, he's not a patrol trained deputy. Right. He's only been with the agency for exactly one year effective today. One year today. Okay. It sounds like there were a lot of people in the house. Was it a gathering, a party that you know of at this point? No, no. As far as we know, it was a, a, a it was in the middle of the night, and the, the home was quiet, and then Mr. Williams showed up and then began this very horrific chain of events. Did, he, did it look like he broke into the home, or did they welcome him? I, well, I don't know. I don't, I, don't think, I don't know that that happened, but I, I, I think at some point he, he was able to get into the home, and that's when all this unfolded. The investigation will reveal that. So he's in the Central Valley out near Kalinga. Uh, our detectives are en route down there, so that's a, a, at least a two hour travel time. Um, we'll meet with them, we'll take custody of him, and then we'll bring him back here. That's going to be a minimum of four to five hours, depending. Um, you, we also have to be mindful uh, that uh, at some point, uh, we, we have a lot of other work to do as well. So he won't be back here till later this evening. Uh, when, he's, uh, when he's safely back here, we'll, we'll let you know. Uh, Ray, I'm sorry, you already mentioned, was he a, a Wiley Manual or an and which I think he, uh, Wiley Manual, and uh, he, he could have uh, also worked at the other courthouse, uh, RCD at Oakland as well. Uh, what kind of car, which car was he in? He was in a gray uh, Volkswagen uh, Jetta. So if there's no further questions, um, I, I want to let you know that our, uh, the city of Dublin has been outstanding uh, in their support. We've spoken to the mayor, our elected officials, our city manager, obviously our police chiefs here. So uh, they, they've been outstanding. Um, we, will be, uh, we, we will be providing any services to the community that's needed. We have counseling services. Within our own organization, we will be providing peer support and counseling. And I do want to credit um, our dispatch center, uh, take a moment. Uh, our dispatchers did a phenomenal job uh, under very difficult circumstances and uh, I want to thank them for what they did. And uh, they often, the work that they do uh, goes unrecognized. I want to make sure I recognize them. So I have one, uh, one last question. Um, at one point, uh, someone came out and asked us to quiet down here and to see the yeah. people gathered. Was that that was the phone call. Yeah, you guys uh, were here when that happened. Um, it just so happened that 
it, it couldn't wait. We had to get to that call and we did it right here. That's why uh, it all unfolded rather quickly. And uh, we're just thankful that this came to a peaceful resolution. And we're trying to make sense of all this and we're really having a hard time. And, uh, but we're strong, we're resilient. Um, this does not reflect who law enforcement is. This is not what we are. This is not what we do. I, I wanna make that perfectly clear. And uh, uh, please just allow us a moment to, to uh, make sense of this. And uh, I wanna thank our chief. He, he does an outstanding job. Uh, he, he, he really showed some tremendous leadership today. So very, very, very honored to work with him uh, and, the, and everybody at our agency that did the right thing and brought this uh, to a peaceful resolution. With that, I think it's, it's time that we uh, go finish some of our work. We'll be in touch with you later. and We'll have follow-up, uh, and you can get a hold of me. Uh, please call me. Uh, I'm going to let Captain Schmidt uh, manage the uh, investigation. Uh, so I'll, uh, my office, the Sheriff's Office, public information team will, will help with the, all the media related to this. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. We'll get you a photo. Yeah.